Right. Dr. Yeah. Tozer, can you hear us? Uh, Dr. Can, Tozer, can, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tozer, I'm Hugh Blackwell, and along with Senator Jerry Tillman, we are co-chairing this committee that's looking into what we might do differently as it relates to school-based administrators. If you would tell us just a little bit about your background and then jump into the topic, which I believe our staff has already uh, talked with you about. Sure. Um, I'll, in terms of my own background, I've been a, uh, I started out early childhood education. I was a, I ran a full, full day, 12 month kindergarten in uptown Chicago in the early 70s. And then I began directing an, uh, a, um, an alternative school for adjudicated Cook County juveniles a little bit later in the 70s before deciding that there was a whole lot I didn't yet understand about the field of education. So I went back and uh, did, uh, did my doctorate at University of Illinois Urbana um, and was immediately hired not to their faculty in the field of teacher education because I began to believe that the data were becoming very clear that low-income kids of any ethnicity could perform at high levels if they got the right quality instruction. So I spent quite a bit of time working in the field of teacher education at University of Illinois at Urbana. I was down there for about 15 years. Um, and before I began gravitating to a new insight, and that new insight was almost nothing that we do in the teacher ed programs is going to be very successful with teachers if they don't get into schools that are organized to support their performance. That is to say that the highest academic performing teachers are the first ones to leave schools that are underperforming because they need to be in an environment where they can succeed and when they're in an environment where they can't succeed, they leave. I began to understand that the, the key to high quality instruction in classrooms is really school leadership. So for the last 14 years, I've been working on uh, uh, re de uh, developing and redesigning and improving a, um, a school leadership and development program, preparation and development program. And that program is one that, that uh, both prepares principals uh, for leadership in its first 18 months. And then after that, it works with principals in role as principals for the next three years. So it's really a four and a half year program that leads to an EDD, an education doctorate. Um, and what we have found is that for 14 years, we've had 98% placement of our people in assistant principal and principal positions, 80% uh, as principals. And the assistant principals who are not principals yet are, you know, are still moving in that direction. And um, we've had a pretty profound impact on Chicago public schools. We've been, therefore, we've received a number of national awards from um, all the major uh, uh, organizations that are, that are functioning in the field of school leadership. Um, and uh, in my PowerPoint, I'll go into greater depth uh, about the impact of what we do, and I'll go into greater depth about how we select and develop um, the, the principles to have the impact uh, that they are now having. Um, I'll say just as an overview, um, that over the past decade, Chicago uh, now outstrips all other districts in the state of Illinois in terms of student gains over time. And for the first time in modern history, Chicago, uh, Chicago's African-American kids now outperform uh, their, their counterpart African-American kids in the rest of the state of Illinois. And this is also true for Chicago's Hispanic kids and Chicago's Latino kids on virtually uh, any uh, achievement test that, that they take. So we've had pretty astonishing results in the last uh, dozen years or so. And um, it's those results that we set out to achieve in the first place. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. And I do have a, a quick PowerPoint that I'd like to walk you through to kind of lay out the basics of this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ready for the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, and then we'll, right, we'll gonna, consider uh, the so questions, can, we'll do the questions at the end. Yeah, that would be terrific. Um, so I will, uh, I will move swiftly through the PowerPoint, 
Um, and if if you I, if you notice things that you want to draw my attention to, make a note, and we'll come back to those. Um, the the cover slide uh, has on its left a, uh, a map of the city of Chicago. Um, we've put 120 principals into the city of Chicago in the last decade from our program alone. Our program and new leaders uh, for new schools, it's now called New Leaders, it's a not-for-profit, have now put over 300 principals in Chicago public schools, uh, which accounts for uh, the, the growth of the school system in terms of student performance. So I'll start with something that you might remember from 1987, U.S. Secretary of Education William Bennett called Chicago the worst school system in America. And at that point, what we began to see is debates over whether we're really the worst or not quite the worst. Maybe we're third from the worst, but that's not the kind of conversation you want your school system engaged in. Um, by, uh, by this past year, we started to see significant um, recognition of the fact that Chicago has really begun turning itself around. Uh, and so this is Crane's Chicago Business, which has been a harsh critic of Chicago Public Schools, now recognizing that on multiple measures, um, Chicago really is out. If Chicago is regarded as a national outlier in terms of what our performance has been, especially with low-income and minority kids, this is a school system that's 85% low-income. And the last line of, the, of Crane's article there says, Chicago's trajectory has de defied the declines reported in many other cities, which uh, is a number of uh, researchers have found this to be true. Um, also, we noticed that uh, this is in the face of not only budget cuts, but it's also in the face of the fact that since we started our program, Chicago Public Schools has had seven different superintendents. And to have seven superintendents of a school system is a recipe for disaster. Um, our school system has no business being on an upward trajectory and yet we are because we have focused on school principals as the fundamental unit of change what we have found is that well prepared and well selected school principals can buffer schools against this ridiculous churn at the top that we've seen in chicago public schools and here we see a, a reports released by university of chicago um, providing additional evidence of the upward trajectory of the school system over the last decade. We're particularly interested in third grade reading scores because we know that third grade reading scores are a tremendous predictor of, um, of eighth grade scores and also high school graduation. And what you notice here very quickly is that on the left side, the city of Chicago, whether we're talking about low income kids at the top of the scale or not <coughs> low income kids at the bottom of the scale, what this tells you is that black kids, Hispanic kids, and white kids all are outperforming their counterparts in the rest of the state of Illinois. And we started out, if you compare the left to the right for low-income kids, for example, Chicago started out below um, uh, the, the rest of the state, and it now substantially, after a decade, uh, substantially outperforms the rest of the state for each demographic group. If you look at fourth grade reading and math scores and you use the National Assessment of Education Pro Progress, which is typically regarded as the gold standard for student assessment, we find that the rest of the state of Illinois, like most of the U.S., is essentially flat over the last, uh, in this case, we're looking at eight years, seven, six years. And what you find um, in Chicago, while the rest of the state and the nation have been flat, is pretty dramatic increases. Um, in turn, from so fourth grade reading and math scores, um, all of this is uh, reminds us of the of the adage that I'm certain you've all heard that your system, any system, is perfectly designed to obtain the results you're obtaining. If you don't make some fundamental changes in how the system operates, you're going to get those same results year in and year out. I quoted Carr on this from 2008 only because Carr is the person that did the research that shows us that we don't really know who first said this, your system, any system quote. <laughs> it's been attributed to a lot of people, but nobody knows who really said it. But um, systems theorists are convinced that this is pretty true, that um, the results that we're getting are the result of a lot of things working together with a lot of unintended consequences. The point of, of uh, our work here is the second bullet, which is the principal preparation and development are key elements of our current results system. This is one of the things that we can really change. 
Uh, there are many aspects of the system, for example, poverty, that it's very difficult for us to change. But even in the face of poverty, even in the face of rising numbers of minority kids who are, are having culturally different backgrounds that they're bringing to the schools, we can still succeed at a high level if we get the right performance in classrooms and in school leadership. And in fact, wall-to-wall -wall high performance in classrooms <coughs> is dependent on high quality school leadership. The last line here is to say that we're finding that no single agency can get this done alone. The state can't do it alone without higher ed in school districts. Districts can't do it alone without state support and higher ed working with them. And, um, and higher ed certainly can't do it alone. And so we actually passed a law in Illinois that no higher ed institution can offer a principal preparation program unless it's done in formal partnership with a school district uh, in collaboration with a school district superintendent. The point being the stakes are too high to leave it to higher ed. And I'm saying this from the perspective of a higher ed faculty member for the past 35 years. We do know that strong principal can dramatically improve school culture climate. We know how principals do this. As Lee Wood says, they've got to be able to lead vision, lead people, and lead systems. We know now, after 14 years of doing this, we're in our 15th cohort right now, that the right kind of teacher can learn how to do this in a carefully designed program. And in a moment, I'll get to how is it that you attract these teachers uh, to want to do this kind of work. The leadership challenge for us at the state district and the higher ed level is organizing our systems to find and develop those leaders. If we don't do that, there's very little reason to believe that we're going to change the learning outcomes of kids. If we do this, there's every reason to believe we can change it. It is a unique leverage point in the entire system. Um, one of the things that we know, this is the logic model that in fact uh, demonstrates how it is that school leaders have such an impact. We have standards for administrative or school leadership in that first box. We have standards in the last box for what we mean by student engagement and learning. We have standards in our field for high quality teaching and instruction. Here's what we don't have standards for. This all important second box, which is organizational resources, organizational capacity of the school. In other words, principals can't affect a high quality, can't affect the quality of teaching and instruction in classrooms that is necessary to get huge impact on student learning unless in fact they put the organizational resources in place to make each school an effective adult learning environment. There are no standards for that. So what we've been working on is doing the practice and the research to try to understand how is it that most of our principals are getting remarkable results? What do they do to create adult learning environments in their schools? So the very act of showing up at work is educational for teachers and they grow professionally. We're learning how to do this at scale, and the scale of principal prep is within our resources to address. You can get all the all the principals in America in the Michigan football stadium. We need about 10,000 new principals annually. Um, we only need 400 new principals annually in Illinois. That's been the case for the last decade. Um, that's, that's less than half the size of my high school class. We need about 250 annually in North Carolina. This is a scale that we absolutely can address if in fact we organize ourselves to address it and make it a point to address it. And it's not very expensive to do it. Um, we could see every program in the state of Illinois operating the way my program operates, which is at the upper funding end. Um, and it would be a rounding error on the state education budget. Um, the characteristics of all next generation programs, and you see I've bulleted, high, uh, bolded, highly effective admissions to structured cohorts. These six um, sort of general characteristics are true of the most successful next generation principal program. They have a results oriented focus on principal impact on schools. Now, look, this is very different from how America operates principal preparation programs right now. The way we operate our principal programs right now is as credentialing operations. We have 43,000 um, certified uh, administrators in the state of Illinois. We've had some universities certifying as many as 600 in a given year for a state that only has 400 vacancies. Illinois is not alone in this. We've been criticized nationally for this as well. We're overproducing principals who in fact will never be principals. 
And so we are not results oriented in our programs. We're credential oriented. We're producing lots of credentials. We're not producing transformational principles in any kind of statistically recognizable way. This requires, in our view, partnerships with districts that invest resources in making this happen because when districts get principals who move the needle to student performance and principals whose retention levels are high, this is a huge payoff for districts. This requires highly selective admissions to structure cohorts of principals. We should be treating our principal preparation programs like we treat medical school admissions. In fact, there are three times as many physicians in the, in the nation as there are principals. This is a scale that we can operate at a, at a much more economically and effective level than we currently are. All of our principals are full-time intensively coached. They have site-based learning with full-year residencies. These residencies and internships are characteristic of the next generation programs in general. We integrate academic and practical learning and their structured post-licensure support to accelerate early career development and success. Everything we know about leadership learning says you can't create a polished principle in a master's program. It just, I mean, it can occasionally be done, but it cannot be done at scale. And the consequence then is we've got to make commitments to early career development of principles as well. If we have districts as partners in preparation and development, this is very much like the medical school model. Um, and a limited number of such partnerships can provide principles for the entire state. Um, it becomes a matter of targeting the programs to the actual needs of the state. This does require district buying and resources for planning, implementation, and assessment. And if it requires district resources, of course, there's obvious reason that we want to get the state involved as they are in Illinois. There are some districts actually that pay for full year residency for principals around the country. Chicago is one of these. The state can support next generation partnerships in a number of ways. One of them is passing new licensure requirements for programs as we've done in Illinois, as Tennessee has done, as Kentucky has done. And there are a couple of national studies right now that you might be familiar with of state policy formation and principal development. We need to see field-based learning and supervision uh, supported. This would require new resources not currently standard in the field. Here's what I mean by that. We all know that we, as, as states and as school and as districts and as higher ed, we invest a lot of a lot of resources in student teaching supervision. We invest virtually no resources in the supervision of principals in residencies in the equivalent of student teaching. We simply haven't come that far as a field. The medical profession was in the same boat 100 years ago. It made a, it made a very sharp turnaround between 1910 and 1920 to make commitment to supervise field experience of medical uh, uh, education students. We need to make that same move in principalship that we made years ago in student teaching. Um, if a limited number of, I, uh, of institutions of higher ed and district partnerships provide principals for the entire state, um, then state support, of course, is going to be necessary. And again, the costs are at scale. And the entire vacancy rate of a, of a state are very small by state budget standards. So what are some keys to recruitment selection, which is, the, um, I think, the center of, of what you hoped I would address today? One of them is that um, there needs to be a very clearly defined mission for programs to attract the quality of, of candidates that you want to attract. Simply getting a credential is not a clearly defined mission. An example of a clearly defined mission would be our clearly defined mission at UIC, but there are others around the country. One, of, one example would be attracting teachers that want to leave schools in, uh, under, in, in high needs urban environments. So our whole program is focused on preparing principals for high need urban environment, urban environments with the effort to improve student learning in those environments. People that don't want to do that don't apply to our program, but it attracts more people than it repels because it's a clear mission that they can get behind. Similarly, we worked with the state of Tennessee about articulating a clear mission, mission in, um, in uh, rural Tennessee for uh, the idea of developing school leadership programs for rural environments. We're doing some of that in Illinois as well. 
the idea being that no two programs have to have the same mission. It really depends upon uh, what is the clientele that you're trying to serve. And here, the clientele is not the graduate student who wants a credential. The clientele is the school system and the kids in that system that you want to serve with your program. So clearly defined mission is critical. Identifying the qualities that you're seeking and selecting for personal characteristics and professional experience. And I'll be very explicit about that in just a moment. Um, it's the personal characteristics and the professional experiences that together shape knowledge, skills, and dispositions. For example, we require that somebody, uh, a candidate to our programs, demonstrate that they have led adults. People who do not have an appetite and a kind of a disposition to seek leadership roles with adults simply, in our experience, don't work out. There's a reason that they don't have a track record of, of leading adults. Um, no matter how great a teacher they are, we're looking for teacher leaders who have actually demonstrated leadership roles with other adults, even though they may have stayed um, as teachers. We recruit in teacher leader pools with such qualities. So, Get your mission straight, identify the qualities you're seeking, and then recruit in teacher leader pools that have those qualities. These are teacher leader pools of things like, for example, um, leaders in special ed programs, leaders in, in English learners programs, uh, leaders in mathematics programs, in elementary and secondary school, department chairs, and so on. In other words, it's the teacher leader pools that are for us yielding the most high quality, high impact candidates those are, the, those are the pools of people we go after. You need to invest in intensive admissions processes, including interviews. Now, this is not very expensive, but it does take faculty time. Um, the, uh, this is, there's the old adage, raise your standards and, and they will come. If you want to, uh, Jim Rotts uh, used to say, if you want to increase your admissions pool, raise your standards. People will come uh, if they think uh, that an operation is high quality. Um, but this means that we have not, in addition to all the paperwork that we review, and the, you know, the normal graduate applications and, and uh, personal statements and so on and so forth, we have a two hour interview process and I can share that with you at some later date if you're interested in that. At the end of that two hour interview process, we're pretty clear on whether this person has the chops uh, to take advantage of what we have to offer. We're looking for real quality in seven different domains here. Um, and the one at the center of it all, ethical conduct and leadership, that domain that drives people to excel in all these other domains, that's the hardest thing to select for. And I gotta tell you, we've lost some principals who have made some ethical missteps uh, once once they were out in the field. So I won't. I won't be misleading about that. This is a very hard thing to select for. Uh, you select for it using letters of recommendation, looking at a person's track record and so on. No matter how careful you are, you're still gonna slip up occasionally because human beings slip up occasionally. What you see above the dotted line is professional characteristics such as, has somebody demonstrated the ability to, uh, to uh, lead education systems, even if it's just at the department level or the grade level? Um, is this an individual who has demonstrated collaborative orientation and working with and leading adults? Or on the right, is this a person that really seems to demonstrate cultural responsive and deep instructional analysis? In other words, does this person know instruction? Does this person know systems? Does this person work well with others? Below the line, we look for personal characteristics such as presence and attitude as a leader. This is one of the reasons we want to interview face-to-face, -face, where we have a panel of interviewers with each, with each candidate. Strengths as a learner in the context of urban schools and diversity. We need to see people who have a learner stance because nobody knows enough when they start a principal program to be an effective principal. They, are, they need to commit themselves to years of learning everything we know about um, about the development of leadership over time in business, in military, in schools, in social service programs, whatever, says it takes years to develop the kind of mature leadership capacity that we're looking for that can move the needle on student learning. And finally, what's the evidence that we see here that this is a person who's committed to equity and excellence above and beyond the organizations that they've been a member of? 
these are all things that you can investigate very well. As I say, the ethical conduct piece is tougher to investigate in the admissions process. Um, our program impact, just very briefly, has been that um, for 14 years now, uh, all of our people have become principals or APs virtually. Um, they do outperform elementary and secondary school system norms, even in Chicago, where the norms are outperforming the state. Our people outperform the system um, uh, at the elementary and the secondary level. Uh, we are particularly stronger in 80% low income, 80% African American schools. That is to say, the schools of the highest minority population and the highest poverty population uh, are, are where we demonstrate particularly um, the, uh, the effectiveness of our people. And of course, over 80% of the school system in Chicago is African American and Latino kids in the first place. So we, we have a pretty big footprint here in the city. Also, the fact that we have higher retention rates for high school and elementary principals makes a big difference. School systems lose a lot of money on principal turnover. The estimates right now are that large cities have roughly uh, 20 to 30 percent annual turnover, and, uh, and that's just way too much to sustain economically. Um, our turnover rate for our principals is, is less than uh, 10 percent, and um, so this is uh, something that is a, is a big investment for districts to make to, to pay attention to. So okay, uh, that, uh, that took a while, uh, and I'm happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. I'm trying to ground this whole issue of, um, of recruitment and, uh, and selection in the wider issue of taking a systemic approach towards school leadership at the state level, district level, and higher ed level. What can I, uh, what can I respond to in terms of questions?